um, web device, phone or whatever, go to uh, Google on your web device. Joe Kim found out that um, YouTube had decided to become the dominant podcast medium. So they've gone into some kind of synergy relationship search-wise with Google. And so if you Google my name, Pitts Evans, and any book and chapter of the Bible, you'll get the either the Wednesday night Bible study referencing that book and chapter or the podcast. So like, for example, if you got Google, do Pitts Evans and put Ruth chapter two, just Ruth two. Do all lowercase, all upper, it doesn't matter. You've done this. No, it, it doesn't work the same way. We use DuckDuckGo. It doesn't work on that one. Well, I use StartPage. So, I, hey, y'all. So, um, anyway, so you can find um, individual books of the Bible really easy um, by those means. Hi, hey, Chris. Uh, which is, I think it's kind of cool. You know, it makes them more accessible. We, we just loaded all of the podcasts onto Google like 10 days, two weeks ago. And so it was like 1,100 of them. Joe just did it spontaneously. And, and uh, the Google, the um, YouTube podcast medium is outpacing all the others, you know, just quickly. That's kind of cool. All right, we are in Ephesians chapter 3 tonight, 3 through 6. And we have a great abundance of material. So this is going to be like a fire hose tonight. It's just one of those nights. There's so much in this section. And um, I will try my best not to preach. There's a lot to preach about. But um, since this is a study and not a, a ministry session, I'll, I'll hold off on the preaching somewhat. Although I can't avoid it completely because of what we're dealing with here. Um, uncharacteristically, I am sipping tea as I'm talking due to my lovely wife fixing, a, fixing tea. So if I stop to have a sip of tea. That's the reason. Let's pray. So, uh, so Lord, we thank you for tonight, and um, we thank you for the tail end of winter and the beginning of spring and summer. Lord, this uh, transition of seasons is always pleasant here in Virginia. Uh, we like the coming of the seasons and the changing of the plants and flowers and trees. Lord, we, we want to be wise about the changing of the seasons spiritually as well. So, Lord, speak to us about the things we're, um, we're looking at tonight. And God, um, guide and direct our conversation in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Elijah, you have not been here in a while, so what we've done is we've not reformatted, but we hold questions to the end. I sign off like right at 8 o'clock, so the Internet, you've been watching on the Internet, okay. So the Internet people can, can break and not have, have confusion with the questions. Ephesians chapter 3, and uh, it is continuing the topic of... The one new man in Christ that we began last week in Ephesians chapter 2. And so Paul said he got into trouble because he was preaching to Gentiles. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ for your sake or for the sake of you Gentiles. And so this is one of his prison epistles. It's believed to have been written while he was incarcerated in Rome. He makes some um, several internal references to being a prisoner. And uh, this is one of his, his references. But the cause of his imprisonment is he didn't stay within the um, confines of the Roman approved religion of Judaism that was, um, that was sanctioned by the Roman government. He, he went AWOL with preaching Jesus. And so then he comes up with this reference to the mystery again. And there's a, there's a number of mysteries in the New Testament. There are 26 um, uses of the word mystery. And Paul here repeatedly uses the word mystery in several verses in chapter 3. So verse 2, Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation. And the mystery is the admission of the Gentiles and the procedure for the admission of the Gentiles into the kingdom. As I've already written briefly, In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has been now revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. And so this, this concept of uh, the revelatory realm being opened once again in the first century was um, a strange concept to the Jews 
who believed that the Lord had um, ceased to prophesy, essentially, with the, publicly, with the Jeremiah's and Isaiah's and uh, Ezekiel's and Zechariah's and so forth. So to say that a mystery was being revealed again publicly by the Holy Spirit was a somewhat provocative statement in and of itself. He goes on to talk about the mystery in verse 6. This mystery, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, and I'm quoting an insertion from Ephesians 2.15, uh, is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body. And so this is... Um, Faithful Christians and faithful Jews coming together in one body, in one collective unit, sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel, the one of the, of the two becoming one in Christ. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. And so I just make a, a note there, this mystery introduced in Ephesians 2, 14 through 16, is that Jesus has reconciled us to God and made us into one new humanity, or as King James says, one new man, consisting of redeemed Jews and Gentiles. And note the word redeemed, because from the point of the coming of Christ forward, it involves our redemption through Christ, not just through Judaism. So this, this mystery, from the time of Adam, there were only Gentiles until the coming of Abraham and Moses. Then there was a new category. We began to refer to them as Jews or um, uh, Hebrews, the Jewish people. The Jewish people received the collective revelation of the one true God for the planet until the coming of Christ. At the time of the coming of Christ, the kingdom was opened up by the Holy Spirit for one new creation. That's the born again believers in Christ. So no longer we have just Gentiles, no longer do we have just Jews, we have a third category of new creations in Christ, this one new man, consisting of both believing Jews and Gentiles. I just put a note in there from the uh, InterVarsity Press Bible background commentary talking about the fact that they were not expecting prophetic revelation in this generation. So for Paul to use this kind of terminology about mysteries being revealed was shocking. Paul's gospel, uh, again, was grace for salvation through Jesus for both Gentiles and Jews. Verse 8, although I am the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery for which, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. And the mystery was kept hidden um, especially from the principalities and powers and demons and Satan himself, because as it says in another place, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory if they'd have known the plan of redemption, what was in store. So the next page in your notes, top of the page, verse 10, uh, more on his mysterious plan. Verse 10, his intent or his intention was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly realms. Now, let me just pause right there. This is talking about spiritual entities. There is, um, uh, is a long, um, tradition's not the right word. There's a long revelation throughout the scriptures, Old and New Testament, about the heavenly council or the divine council, where uh, the Lord consults with other spiritual beings on, on different at different times. we we'll talk about that another time. I can give you plenty of chapter and verse on that. But this is the, the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. At one time, the angels that fell had places there. At some point, they still have to go back there and check in, like in Job, Job chapter one, Job chapter two, came a day the sons of God came to present themselves. And so these rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms were not expecting creatures created out of dust to have access to those realms at some point. And so the Lord is showing off his redemptive plans forever. You know, okay, you guys rebelled. We talked about this briefly last week, I believe, didn't we? Or a week or two weeks ago. But the Lord is showing off his heavenly plan of redemption to those who rebelled, saying, even the dust loves me more than you love me. I'll even make greater beings out of the dust than I created you to be 
eons and endless ages ago. And so it goes on, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, he's in prison, which are, are your glory. And then I make note, this is another mention, the heavenly realms is another um, nod to Jesus fulfilling the promises of Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Great messianic proof text, because uh, Jesus was David's Lord who sat at Yahweh's right hand. So it's used all through the New Testament. This sitting in heavenly realms, making known in heavenly realms, is where Jesus presides now. It's where he's ruling and reigning. Verse 14, For this reason... I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. In other words, for this great wisdom, this mysterious wisdom of the Almighty, Paul says he bows his knee to this eternal being who came up with this plan. Then he gives one of his many um, apostolic prayers in Ephesians. And um, this one is, is um, um, a good one to kind of pray into yourself. I, you know, we were applying these verses last week to ourselves in various ways. And I'm not going to take a lot of time to do that, but these prayers are some of the, the best uh, prayers in Scripture to insert yourself into in your own prayer time. But Paul's words, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. That's a great prayer. We all want to be strengthened with the power of the spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And so this, this um, dimensional quotation he gives, wide and high and deep, there's some inference that it may be Cube-like. The wording may be cube-like, so he could have been giving a nod to the Holy of Holies, which was a cube. You know, that no longer the place is filled with the presence, it's us who's filled with the presence. But whatever the case, he's praying that we will have a revelation of how much the Lord Jesus loves us. That it's so far beyond our human understanding, we need the revelation of his love to appreciate it. I know I certainly do. Verse 20, now to him, this is a blessing. Um, sometimes this is used as a benediction. The word benediction just simply means blessing. But if you recall, David frequently said, bless the Lord. Many of the Psalms, bless the Lord. I bless the Lord. It's something we have as a privilege of human beings. Paul here blesses the Lord. Verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Now imagine this eternal being who created everything, who um, pre-existed before anything. Imagine that we have the privilege to bestow blessings on him. You know, scripture says normally blessings come from the greater to the lesser. But in the case of God's people, we have been invited to enter into blessing the Lord. So part of my, my personal prayer life is blessing the Lord. A lot of times I'll start a prayer. I'm not talking about publicly. I'll start a prayer privately by blessing the Lord. Sometimes it's just, very, just those words. You know, I bless you, Lord. That, that, that's simple. Or it can be a little more expansive. But it's a great privilege, you know, to... And it, apparently um, it is something that Paul was invested in as part of his prayer life. So I, I commend it to you as well. I think it's... a should be part of all of our prayer lives. He's certainly worthy of it. All right. Ephesians chapter 4 is a very interesting power, not a chapter, not like um, Ephesians chapter 3 was not. But Ephesians chapter 4 has a lot um, to unpack on it. First, again, Paul makes reference to being a prisoner for the Lord in verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord... Then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. That's an admonition for everybody. That's not just for super saints. 
But the idea of living a life that was worth Jesus dying for should be in the, in the forefront of all of our minds. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Notice that verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity and just full stop. That implies it takes work. Spiritual unity is not a natural thing that we're just going to fall into. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then he goes on to emphasize what our unity should be found in. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope, when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over us all and through all and in all. This is a, a, just a quick aside. The last time I actually looked into it, there were over 30,000 denominational and parachurch organizations dividing the body of Christ among themselves. Um, there is a, there's a benign affiliation with groups, and then there is a, a I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm, a, I'm of the Baptist, I'm of the whatever. There's a divisiveness in the body um, that is, in my, my opinion, a doctrine of demons. That doesn't mean everybody has to be an independent charismatic church. But people frame um, the scriptures in various ways, and then they become identified with the way they frame and interpret the scriptures. I think that's very divisive. We, um, it's impossible for everybody, everybody in this room, I could sit down with you individually, and we could start in Genesis 1.1, we wouldn't go two pages before we found something we disagreed with. However, there has to be certain things that bring us unity, and those things are in Christ. We're unified around Jesus Christ. We're unified in the one faith, the one body, the one spirit. With these things, there should be unity. And so you want to you wanna have grape juice with your communion, help yourself. You want to have wine with your communion, help yourself. It does, you know, these things should not divide us, but they do. They do. And so it's... Uh, <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> I don't know that we will ever live to see um, on this side of the return of Jesus, the church of Jesus, the universal church of Jesus Christ in full unity. But it is the desire of the Lord, clearly from the scriptures. And we should try to cooperate. You know, one, one thing we can all do as individual believers is you need to look at other believers, and I'm talking about genuine believers, from whatever tradition they come from, as co-laborers, not as competitors. You know, we're, we're quick among churches to say um, they're, they're another group as if they're separate. They're not separate. They're co-laborers. You know, they're not competitors. We're not competing to get the constituency out of that church into our church. We're trying to get the lost into the kingdom. So the unity is only found in Jesus. That's her objective. Verse 7. Now this is a, a reference to Jesus ascending into heaven. And sometimes this um, little section, I believe, is misinterpreted. Verse 7. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ appointed it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? Some people think that refers to hell. I do not. He who then descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. I believe the descended into the earthly regions, regions, regions is talking about the incarnation of Christ in the days of his humanity. But it's a quote uh, from Psalm 68, verse 18. And Paul takes a little liberty with the text. Uh, the Psalm 68, verse 18 reads, When you ascended on high, you took many captives and you received gifts from people. That's pretty close. Even from the rebellious, so that you, Lord, might dwell there. And so um, this, this um, rabbinic interpretation, if you will, from Paul was allowed. He was able, of course, under the inspiration of the Spirit to spin it a little bit, talking about... Um, um, giving gifts to his people and then um, saying, what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended. A little literary license was allowed in that type of um, interpretation. Then we come to 
what are known as the five-fold ministry gifts in some circles. Really a bad term because there are more than just these five. But it says, verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Remember, he um, uh, took many captives and gave gifts in verse 7. And then he uses that same word that's translated as gifts as gave. He gave, Christ himself gave, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. So these are gift ministries, as we'll find in a few minutes, to equip God's people. But let's just pause for a second on the, on the ones that are listed here. Another list appears in, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are other references to other um, gifts that are ministry functions. I don't believe these are ranks. I don't believe the apostle is the general and the prophet is the colonel, etc. I believe they're functions. And so you can identify someone by their function, as we do in our culture in various ways, but it's not a rank. Prophets don't outrank pastors, teachers, etc. You understand what I'm saying? It's a spiritual function. And the idea that he gave these um, implies that whatever divine enabling there is came from above. He didn't select existing ones. He created them through the gifting. So he might have picked people with certain natural attributes, but nevertheless, these functions were divine impartations. They were gifts, spiritual gifts, just like wisdom, knowledge, and so forth in, in 1 Corinthians 12, spiritual gifts. So the purpose for which these gifts or gift offices are given to equip God's people for works of service. Let's just pause right there. Normally we think of those captions as the function. In other words, the apostle does apostolic stuff. The prophet does prophetic stuff. The evangelist does evangelistic stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But the real purpose is for them to equip God's people to do those things. You know, that's, a, that's kind of a breakaway from the way we normally read that. So genuine apostles should begat more apostles. Genuine prophets should spin off more prophets. Genuine evangelists should be turning out more evangelists. You follow? It's contagious. That's their, that's their function. So that the body of Christ may be built up until, verse 13, until we all reach unity and become mature, King James says. NIV says, until... We all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Now, pause right there again, that until. Has until happened yet? Has all of the body of Christ become mature, reached unity of the faith, and um, uh, been filled with the knowledge of God? Has that happened universally on the planet? That, that's a big problem for those who believe these offices ceased are these functions ceased, that until, that one word until, because it's, it's, you can't argue that that's happened yet. The church is not mature as Christ. He's the standard. So these things are to function until that's accomplished. Verse, um, let me just back up to 13 again. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Pretty, pretty high bar. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Is that verse still happening, sadly, broadly in the body of Christ? People are being deceived. People are being blown by every wind of teaching, uh, by the cunning and craftiness of deceitful schemers. Drinking tea is probably not good while you're trying to talk. I think it's a perfect thing. Think it's all right? Do you on the internet think this is kind of a bougie thing of me drinking tea? <laughs> it's my girls say, my daughters say bougie. <laughs> I don't know what it means, but I think that's what they say. <laughs> Did I say something bad? Okay. All right, so spiritual gifts are given for the body of Christ. They're given for the edification of the body of Christ, not just for the recipient of the gift to put that title on their business card to promote themselves or their quote-unquote ministry. The gifts are for the body. From him, Jesus, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament 
grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So we're all supposed to, to row the boat. It's again, it's for the equipping of God's people for works of service. So I tell you this, and, and uh, I'm just going to skip over the top of the next page because it gives the converse of the world's version. Uh, number seven, put off your old ways and learn to live righteously in Jesus. The top of the next page, verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires and to be made new in the attitude of your mind. Now, put on the new self. Notice the wording. Put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we're all members of one body. This putting on the new self is a process. In a, in a few more chapters, we're going to get to putting on the armor of God. People have a lot of hocus pocus ideas about that, but it's, it's really relational. It's not that you make a chant, I'm now putting on this or putting on that. It's who you're becoming in Christ that equips you, that protects you, that clothes you, coats you, etc. And so this putting on the new self, this is a, um, a process of our minds being redeemed and us becoming more Christ-like, hopefully, as the years go by. What are you missing, buddy? Oh. So, um, verse 26, he gives some instructions for putting on the new self. In your anger, do not sin. Do not, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that, so that they may have something to share with those in need. Verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful for building up others according to their needs so that it may, be, may benefit those who listen. So some of these things, they don't just happen instantaneously when somebody comes to the Lord. It takes, a, we need time for the Spirit to work in lives and to begin that transformation. Now, we come to a verse that is one of my favorites, but probably for a reason that you may not have embraced. Verse 30, I'll read the verse first. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So he talks about all this bad stuff you shouldn't do. And then he adds, and don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, I was raised um, by a very devout, spirit-filled mother um, who had a dove, a glass, stained glass dove hanging in the kitchen window where the sun would hit it hanging over the sink. And so from my earliest childhood mem memories, the Holy Spirit was um, portrayed as the dove that descended on Jesus at his baptism. And so I remember as a young person being in many church services where they were afraid to grieve the Holy Spirit because the presence of God would leave. And so I got the idea that he's very nervous. Uh, he, he needs... Uh, you need to handle him with protection, in essence. He's like the mother of the Godhead, you know, that Jesus and the Father are looking out for the Holy Spirit. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. He is God. And this verse is trying to protect us. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, that sounds good. Why? Well, Isaiah gives us a clue. Isaiah 63, verse 10, talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness. Yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned and became their enemy and he himself fought against them. And so you grieve the Holy Spirit, he's just going to fly away like a dove. <laughs> that would be the good result. But here it says he turned and became their enemy. God forbid that should happen to us. That Isaiah passage and what it refers to is repeated in Hebrews, talking about the same rebellion in the wilderness. Verse um, Hebrews chapter 3. Notice the pronouns in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 and following. So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me. Notice the pronoun. Though for 40 years they saw what I did, that was why I was angry with that generation. I said... 
Their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. That puts a different spin on it, doesn't it? It really does for me because um, he's not just the messenger boy of the father. He's not just the messenger boy of the son. He is God, just like they are. And he has, uh, he has his own power, authority, and personality. And he doesn't suffer fools gladly, apparently. You know, he doesn't put up with a lot of nonsense. So he, we next get some of the things that actually grieve the Holy Spirit and some things that please him. I should say some more things that grieve him because we had some in verse 26 and following. Verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. These are things that upset the Spirit. Conversely, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, uh, in Christ, God forgave you. So those are things that are attractive to the person of the Spirit. All right, time, uh, time is moving on, and I got to... I got a lot of stuff to dig into, so I'm going to move forward. All right, let me let me um, step aside from the text for a second. In in really Greco-Roman culture, primarily Roman culture, it was common for households to have. Everybody see that little sign over there by the door? It's like a little little. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. Often in households, you'd have a list of household rules, assigned duties. Some of you may have done that with your kids. You know, like the kids are supposed to do this or not do that or whatever. But they would have what are known as household codes. And so these household codes outlined um, family members' individual responsibilities. Not like chores, but the, the um, uh, chain of command kind of thing for various aspects of their lives. Here Paul gives us household codes with deeper meanings. He does the same thing in Galatians. I alluded to this uh, when we're in Galatians, but this is more extensive now in Hebrew, in um, Ephesians. So it starts out in uh, verse one before we get to the codes. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering, as a sacrifice to God. Then he talks more a, little, a bit more about immorality and, and um, uh, what I believe are dirty jokes or coarse joking. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking. By the way, one of the common New Testament Greek words for um, fornication, sometimes translated fornication, sometimes immorality, uh, is pornonia, from which we get the word pornography. So there's no... They didn't have printed pornography, but they certain the concept is contained in the things to avoid. But avoid uh, obscenity, foolish talk, and coarse joking, which are out of place um, rather than Thanksgiving. And so these, these um, uh, once again, sometimes people come into the kingdom and they have foul mouth. I, I told a friend of mine who is now deceased that I thought his tongue was going to be the last thing to get saved. <laughs> because he cussed <laughs> right up to the grave almost. <laughs> he, was a, he was an interesting guy. He was saved, by the way. Verse five, for of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater. That's interesting. The Lord considers immorality, impurity, and greed as idolatry. The various gods represented that in the Old Testament. Any of these people have any inheritance in the kingdom of God, of kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. And so as believers, we are, you know, we get, we can get caught up in legalism. I'm not prescribing legalism, but we should not look like everybody else as this thing goes forward. You know, there should be a difference between the way God's people behave and people who don't know God. It's just that simple. And so the, the level of transition and all that varies from person to person, but we should be becoming new in Christ. And um, uh, some of the things, patterns of the old life are just not appropriate in the kingdom. So we got to live as children of light, Paul says. Verse seven, do not be partakers with them, those people who do the other stuff. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light 
consist in all goodness and righteousness and truth and find out what pleases the Lord. That's a big one because we want to do what, what our Savior, King, Bridegroom loves. That's what we want. We're, we're not trying to impress anybody but Him. It's all, this, all this is being done for the applause of the audience of one, you know, in my opinion. It, to some degree, <laughs> and I'm going to choose this carefully, Mary's here. She can verify it, though. For some, to some degree, I care very little what other people think, but I care a great deal about what God thinks. That's, that's really the whole purpose of the deal. I know we're all human beings, but really we're supposed to be living for what he thinks. All the rest of it's just noise, more or less. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in, in secret. Verse 13, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it's said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, there's a, there's a mention in this next verse about um, don't, a prohibition against being drunk on wine. And then it, it gives a converse. It says, instead, be filled with the Spirit. I'll read it and then we'll, we'll talk about it just for a minute. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to the God, uh, to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I, I can't prove this from charismatic church history, but I believe the terminology drunk in the Spirit comes from this little passage. Anybody here not heard the term drunk in the Spirit? And so the idea is being so heavily influenced by the uh, the present manifested level of the Holy Spirit that you, you're losing your balance, equilibrium, and so forth. Genuine phenomenon. But I don't think this is what it's talking about. It's, it, you can use it for that. I understand that. But the don't get drunk on wine, the, the dr don't get drunk on wine is probably going all the way back to Aaron's son, Adab and Abihu, or Nadab and Abihu, who were the ones that offered strange incense in the tabernacle of Moses, and then they were immediately consumed with fire. In that same chapter, it goes on to say, the priests who are ministering to the Lord should not be under the influence of alcohol. So I personally believe it's tying the two concepts together. This don't get drunk on wine, that's a universal prohibition throughout the scriptures. You're not supposed to get drunk. But instead, be filled with the Spirit. That's what you are supposed to do. Be filled with the Spirit. So it's not talking about levels of intoxication. You know, a good level of intoxication versus a bad. The alcohol intoxication is not prescribed ever. The, being filled with the Spirit is always prescribed, but it doesn't always equate to being losing your balance. You know, could just be holiness and so forth. And so um, I don't think the two are synonymous with one another. But it says, for, if you're filled with the Spirit, you should be speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. You should sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to the God and Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say if you're filled with the Spirit, you should be falling down all over the room. If you do, you do. But it doesn't, that's not what's in the text. Agreed? Everybody see, I'm not trying to belabor a point, but okay. Now the household codes. For some reason, people seem to omit verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That is where it starts. My, my NIV Bible actually divides verse 21 from verse 22 with a caption in verse 22 saying um, guidelines for husbands and wives. But that verse 21 is part of the guidelines. It's a very important part. Submit yourselves one to another out of reverence for Christ. That's for the whole family. That's for everybody that follows. Submit yourselves out of, to one of another um, out of reverence for Christ. In other words, this is for the Christian members of your family, if you consider yourself a Christian. This is for the Christ-centered, believing 
members of your household. Submit to one another. And then starts with wives. This is the one that's usually quoted. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the, his church, uh, his body rather, which, of which he's the savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so, all sh so wives should submit to their husbands and everything. I, honestly, I could spend the next half hour on this one little passage, but I, I won't uh, belabor it that much. You're late, I'm sorry, you're going to hell, you have to leave. That's what happens to people on the internet if you show up, no. <laughs> uh, we're, on, we're on page five of the notes. We're in, we're in Ephesians chapter five. Verse 22. <laughs> Everybody, you'll be terrified to ever come to my Bible study late, right? <laughs> okay, squirrel. This idea of wives submitting to their own husbands, that is a, that is a legitimate biblical principle. However, first notice, it's to your own husband. It's as you do to the Lord, and then it says, as the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body. In other words, the wife is being compared to the body of Christ. The wife in the marriage is being compared to the body of the husband. Everybody tracking with me? Of which he's the savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also the wives should submit to their husbands and everything. He's setting up a paradigm here. I, I firmly believe that you know, on this side of the grave, Christian wives should defer at impasses to their husbands. But impasses should be very, very rare. Very rare. You know, the idea is to come to some consensus long in Christ, long before you get to an impasse. And the, the way you come to a consensus is, what is really the Lord saying we should do? Not what I want, not what you want, but what does the Lord want? That's the way you come to a consensus in a Christian family. But then it goes from the wives, which seems like the, the tougher standard. Paul and the Holy Spirit, speaking through Paul, gives husbands a higher standard than he gives to the wives. He says, husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church. Now, let's just pause there for a second. Who on earth can love anybody like Jesus loved the church? Yeah, I mean, it implies serving the church all your life. It implies dying for the church. It implies saving the church. It implies so much more than we're capable of doing to begin with, even if you wanted to. And so the bar for husbands is much higher, not only here, but in 1 Peter chapter 3, which I don't have time to go to. But here, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself. Now just note that presentation because he's making a parallel for husbands and their wives. Christ was to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, just like Jesus did with the church, excuse me, in the same way, Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. So this is, um, uh, let me just pause for a second, a couple of things on this. The idea of husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, it does not say wives love your husbands as Christ loved the church. Why? Because prior to that, he had given the, the ladies a subordinate position relationally as far as the headship, but it's for a purpose, and it's temporary. It's not permanent, and it's for a test. It's for tests for men, and it's for tests for women, and it applies to this side of the grave. It's all as submission to Christ. That's the analogy. How do you submit to Christ? And so any Christian husband who demands more in submission of their wife to them than they demand of themselves to the Lord has already lost the battle. Do you understand what I'm saying? That hits the higher standard. And so any Christian woman 
would submit to a husband that loved her as much as Jesus loved the church and loved her like Jesus loved the church, i.e. served her, sacrificially protected her, um, sanctified her with the washing of the word, these things. You follow? It's a, it is a um, expression of love, not an expression of um, relinquishing your rights. You know, we, we get the concept of relinquishing rights. It's not that. And so notice the impossibly different standards for husbands. And then also notice the many references to the word body. He says, no one hates their own body. The idea being that she's you. She's you. You mistreat your wife. You're mistreating yourself in the eyes of God. She's part of you and you're part of her. Paul's profound mystery is about Christ in the church. And um, uh, there are 27 New Testament verses that use the word mystery, but there's only one profound mystery. And it's, it's related to these concepts. It comes in um, Ephesians verse 31 and 32. For this reason, all these submissions, mutual loving submissions, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, that is one body. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. Now, wait a minute, Paul, so you're talking about husbands and wives. No, I'm talking about, I'm really talking about Christ in the church friends, I'm really telling you your marriage should be teaching you eternal things about Christ and the church. And for those who are not married, they should be able to observe in Christian marriages principles that are applicable to them and Jesus. That's the idea. The whole thing, it it is a real um, God-given institution that heaven blessed from the time of Adam and Eve on. But at its highest and best, it's training us for eternity. At its highest and best, it's presenting a parable of relationship that the world should desire in when they see Christian marriages played out properly. Am I, am I wording this where everybody's grabbing it? So this, Paul is actually quoting from the marriage of Adam and Eve. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and then shall become one flesh or one body. That's the first marriage. So in saying this, Paul is saying that all human marriage is intended to typify the relationship between Christ and his church. Not that one's going to be a male, one's going to be a female. Those concepts are on this side of the grave. But relationally, he's going to be the head forever. He's going to be the head relationally. And he's going to be in a loving relationship with us 24-7 that can be compared to a good marriage. That's the profound mystery. Every time you see marriage in the Bible, you should look for what that's trying to teach us about our relationship with Christ. And there's endless material there to choose from. All right, let's move on. Ephesians 6, these household codes continue. First, there are rules for children in relating to their parents. Remember, this is Christian children. (laughs) Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on earth. And by the way, it's a good thing to read that to unbelieving children, but really it's, <laughs> it's expected of believing children. It's a little easier to enforce with a believing child. And then there's rules for interaction between Christian fathers and their children. Interestingly, no similar passage for the Christian mothers. But it says, fathers do not exacerbate your children Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. What's the implication of this? The implication is that fathers, more often than mothers, will exacerbate uh, their children. They'll uh, exasperate their children. So um, don't do that. (laughs) Don't do that. And confess when you do that. Now, there's, there's rules for interaction between Christian slaves and Christian masters. How can that be, you might ask? Glad you asked. We'll get to that. It says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Well, wait a minute. I I have rights. Yeah, yeah, I know. But this is talking about eternity. This is talking about your development as a born-again believer for eternity, here and now. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, Doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly 
as if you were serving the Lord and not people, because you know that the Lord will, re will reward each one for whatever is good or whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And then it gives a, a standard for masters. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Now, I might add that the, the whole book of Philemon speaks to the issue of, of um, slavery and slaves and masters. In times gone by, these passages have been used to justify slavery. I don't think slavery is intended to be justified, Old Testament or new. I think these are, these are um, my notes on the next page, and these are my personal thoughts. You can think what you want. But I ask the question, is this an affirmation of the institution of slavery? My opinion is that God allowed many things that were not his original plan. One example is that of eating meat. It's clear from several passages, but one in particular, that um, mankind did not eat meat until after the flood. And I give Genesis 9, verse 3. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. And so the idea among the, the, the rabbis is that the dietary laws themselves are to remind us that heaven condescended to allow us to have meat, but it was not heaven's original intention. I think the slavery thing is, is similar to that. In the Messianic kingdom, in Isaiah 65, verse 25, the wolf and the lamb will feed together. One is a carnivore, one is an herbivore, but they're not going to be enemies anymore because they're all going to be herbivores again. And the lion will eat straw. Lions don't eat straw. So there'll be a return to this um, lack of meat eating, at least among the animal kingdom, perhaps among us as well. Another example is divorce. You may remember that the Pharisees were pointing out to Jesus that Moses allowed divorce, and it actually is allowed in the Old Testament. But Jesus replied, Matthew 19, 8, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I think the slavery issue is the same way. It was not that way. And so, personal opinion, slavery was allowed but not condoned. In my view, God was essentially saying, since mankind has developed a system of slavery, they must learn to treat each other as brothers in Christ before they'll do away with it permanently. So that's a personal take on that. It is a, a pernicious institution. Um, it has not gone away. I deal with slavery today um, in Africa, and mostly in trafficked people. But it, there are slave markets. There are slave economies. There are people being sold tonight somewhere, literally. Final exhortation begins with a call for perseverance in our faith. It says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So this is like many of the, the exhortations in Scripture, be strong, be courageous. Then we come to the armor of God, which I call the relationship armor. <laughs> this is a personal pet peeve of mine because I've heard so much silly stuff. But it says, put on the armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And so the question is, what does it mean to put on the armor of God? What is he talking about? Put on the armor of God. He goes on to mention verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, okay, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. Another nod to Psalm 110. Spiritual forces in the heavenly realms are the, the higher celestial beings, bad guys and good guys. And so these, the, first of all, these rulers, authorities, powers of the dark world, spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. These are not ordinary devils, demons. Demons you cast out. Demons you drive out with the word. These you struggle against. These you wrestle with, the King James says. We can contend with them, but it's not the same procedure. Do <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? There, it's a different, these are different rankings of individual evil entities. Yes, we have authority to contend with them, but it's not the same as with a, a normal demon. And so we, our struggle... Our struggle involves our authority, and our authority is dependent on Christ and our relationship with Him. This idea of being seated with Him in heavenly realms, our authority comes from our relationship with Him, not by how we recite the individual components we view as the armor of God. 
I've known people to have like a little card in their pocket and in the morning they'll put it out, pull out their little card and they'll go, now I put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now I put on the helmet of self. It's really nonsense. It's this Christian hocus pocus. Because if you have the relationship, you have the armor. If you don't have the relationship, you can say the words. It doesn't do you any good. <laughs> it's just nonsense. It's witchcraft, isn't it, Bill? <laughs> no, don't answer that, Bill. I'll be the one in trouble. <laughs> So, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that in the day of, day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. He's talking about these spiritual entities. Stand your ground, and after you've done everything to stand, stand firm. So it's a higher level of um, uh, standing. Stand firm. How? With the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Friends, all of that is an illustration. That is not a methodology. So these are illustrations that were common in Paul's day, taken from the Roman Empire. Some of the armor that's mentioned were parts of the Romans... Um, regalia that they would put on, breastplates and belts and swords and all these things. But the idea of standing in the day of battle was a, a somewhat unique modification that the Romans brought to warfare. And they were virtually invincible if they all stood. They would not retreat. They would not relinquish their, their position. They wouldn't break ranks. And so the belt of truth is mentioned here in Ephesians 6. The breastplate of righteousness is mentioned the breastplate of righteousness is also mentioned in Psalm 132 and uh, verse, verse 9 and Isaiah 59, 17. There's a breastplate of faith and love mentioned in 1 Thessalonians. That is not a different piece of armor. It's another analogy. The gospel of peace, talking about your feet shod, shoes of the gospel of peace, is not talking about some um, uh, spiritual garment that you have imaginary placed on yourself. It's a reference to relationship. You're having this relationship with the gospel. The shield of faith is, is mentioned in Psalm 91, verse 4 as well. But the shield of faith is having faith in the Lord. It's not, now I'm holding up an imaginary shield, you know, by faith. It's not that. It's I have faith in the Lord. I have faith in the word of God. I have faith in the person of God. I have faith in the call of God, the leading of the spirit. It's not, a, it's not a, something apart from God. It has to do with the relationship with God. Uh, all of these things. Helmet of salvation. You can't put the helmet of salvation on if you're saved. <laughs> if you're saved, you should never take it off. There's no reason to take it off. The, uh, the sword of the spirit, etc. You got it. Okay. I don't have time to go into it tonight, but there are myriads of garments and jewels and crowns listed in scripture. I got a handful of them there. These all allude to aspects of our relationship. Garments of fine linen, garments of praise, garments of salvation, garments of vengeance, robe of justice, robe of righteousness, robe dipped in blood, a cloak of zeal, a turban of justice. All these things are indicative of relationship, just like marriage is indicative of our relationship with Jesus intended. These clothes are intended to illustrate something from a human perspective that we're familiar with. We all know what clothes are. In Paul's day, they knew what the Roman armor was. He's trying to illustrate spiritual principles using earthly things we're familiar with. And so the idea of seeing a Roman soldier wearing his armor, that was what they dealt with day after day. Paul was saying, relationally, you should be covered with your relationship with Christ, just like they are with the spiritual, physical things you see hanging on them. Okay, enough of that. Paul directs us to pray and continue praying in the Spirit, verse 18. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with every kind of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of God's people. Excuse me. And then Paul the Apostle, this encourages me, because he asked them to pray for him. You know, I like that. I, I'm reluctant often to ask people to pray for me. But if Paul was seeking prayer, we all ought to be asking people to pray for us too. He says, pray for me also, so that whenever I speak, words may be given to me, 
so that I will be fearlessly, uh, th so that I will fierce, fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am, am an ambassador in chains. That's where he started chapter three, remember? I'm in chains for your sake because I, I shared the gospel with you. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And that's a good prayer. I'd like y'all to pray that for me too, that I would not be an ambassador in chains, but that I would declare the gospel fearlessly. He then commends or, or recommends a man named Tychicus, um, who is apparently bringing this letter to Ephesus. He says, Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant of the Lord, will tell you everything so that you may know how I am and what I'm doing. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose so that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. So just like Phoebe did in the Romans, he probably took this letter to the Ephesians. And then it closes with um, a blessing and farewell. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. And we all say amen to that. Don't turn us off just yet, Josh. So back to the idea of imagery conveying heavenly concepts with earthly imagery. The entire Bible uses imagery that we're familiar with as human beings because none of us have yet existed on the other side, as far as we know. We don't have memories or understanding about what comes next. So when Jesus says to the, in the parables of the faithful um, steward who got 10 talents and got 10 more, that he would get 10 cities for being a faithful steward, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get 10 cities here or the equivalent of 10 earth cities there. It's saying, you know how big a deal it is if I gave you 10 cities. The magnitude of what you're going to be responsible for there is like if I gave you charge of 10 cities. You follow? There's many concepts like this. And so sometimes we, get, we, we, we can envision a mansion on a street of gold. We can't envision the reality of what comes next. On earth, that's a pretty good thing. There, it may be nothing compared to the reality. He's using earthly imagery to convey spiritual principles. So the idea of marriage. Marriage is here and now, it has a purpose in the natural on earth for procreation, relationship, fellowship, and all that. But the spiritual principles convey things beyond our understanding. The part that we do understand is marriage at its highest and best is a loving relationship between two people. The Lord says in the simplest form, I want a loving relationship with you that is steady. It's not two hours a week, one hour a week or whatever. It's 24-7 for life, except in the case of God, it's 24-7 forever. The armor of God, these, these spiritual garments, again, he's using imagery. You know, Revelation um, 19, where it talks about uh, the, the bride has made herself ready. You know, fine linen was given her to wear. Fine linen equals the righteous acts of the saints. It's, we're adorned with our relationship from an eternal perspective. We're, as I said in another study, we're actually sowing into our own spiritual DNA by the life that we live and the decisions we make in agreement with the Lord. So it's mystical. Paul says mystery, profound mystery. Yeah, Paul, it's a profound mystery. But it is understandable. It's not... It's not just for the select few. It's for all of us to grasp these things. It's not just for some special people somewhere to get the, you know, to get the secret handshake and get told what this is. These are all our inheritance. All those 26 mysteries in the New Testament are your inheritance and mine. They're knowable. They're revealed. We just have to look at them with the right eyes. All right. Lord, I bless you. If I've said anything that's not from you, let it fall from the ground. But Lord, if I've spoken by your spirit, let the words take deep root in the hearts and spirits and minds of the hearers. Let them bring forth an abundant harvest of love and joy and righteousness, peace and relationship with you, Lord, that nothing, nothing, nothing will ever shake. In Jesus' name, amen.